friends, and welcome back for another episode of Young, Young David Changed the Trend Podcast. <laughs> Well, we are so, so excited for this episode because we are here with our first official guest, Father Linus, who is here at St. Bernard Prep, and he's the current prior, is that correct, of the Benedictine yes. community here? Wonderful. We're so excited and, to have you, and, Father. And admissions director and novice master. Wow. <laughs> lots of, lots of hats he has to wear. Um, I'm Sister Gianna. I'm Jose. I'm Diego. I'm Arturo. <laughs> I'm Molly. I'm Claudia. <laughs> I'm Emma. And I'm Maddie. Yes, and so before we start, uh, I would like to invite you, Father, if you could, uh, we're so edified by your presence, if you could lead us into prayer before we begin. Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious Father, we come to you in thanksgiving. We ask you to bless us as we make this podcast, and we ask to bless all those who will see it, that it may inspire them to do exactly what God wants them to do with their lives. We ask this as we ask all good things through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. So in this episode, uh, we are going to interview Father. He's going to share with us his vocation story, which I actually have not heard yet. So this is really exciting. And he's going to talk about the priesthood. We have a couple questions lined up. So I'm sure Father is very prepared for that. I've been a long, big fan of his homilies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> They're like concise. And they're not over, they're like right straight to the point when he speaks about the gospel. And one thing I wanted to share that's interesting uh, is that in my past years of teaching, I currently have four young men that I know that are, that two of them I taught in high school and they are in the seminary. So I want to give a shout out to Jonah and Sebastian. They're in the Philippines in the seminary. I taught them in high school. And also Carl, he is a senior at Holy Spirit in Huntsville. He's also seriously discerning the priesthood he wants to enter the seminary and luke daly who is in eighth grade here he's also interested in the priesthood and so i'd love it father if you could get advice for that but first uh yeah just share with us uh your vocation story and oh if you could just tell us too what what is the priesthood and why is it important okay uh well i would say the priesthood in a nutshell is the continuation of Christ's ministry in the world. That God has not only come into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, but he's also in a very special way continued that ministry through the unique ministry of the priesthood. Uh, all of us as Christians are called to continue Christ's ministry in the world and to convert the world and to bring the world to Jesus, but priests are called to do that in a very special way by administering the sacraments. So I, I would say in, in continuing Christ's ministry in the world. <clears throat> okay, beautiful. So we could also say that a priest is another Christ. Yes, is that correct, in, in Father? Persona Christi, yes. Persona Christi, beautiful. And one quick question, Father. Yes. Um, how come um, they can only be men that are priests? Uh, that has been the consistent tradition of the church, and it the priest is in the person of Jesus, and Jesus was not only human, he was also male. So that has been the consistent idea of the church that you are taking on the person of Christ, and in doing so you would be, uh, it would be restricted to, to males. Beautiful, and I just want to say, Father, that I'm so edified by your presence here in this classroom, oh, and I you. love the presence of the monks because they are Christ for us and you do have those consecrated hands and you bring us Jesus every day and because of that I, we wouldn't we couldn't exist and we couldn't survive mm -hmm. without that gift of the priesthood so yeah thank you good question all right father well if you want to go ahead into it and just kind of tell us uh, how you, when how when <laughs> mm -hmm. it all happened okay your vocation well I, when I, I was baptized as an infant and when my, my mother brought me home, she put me in the cradle, and I spoke from the cradle and said, Mother, God has given me a vocation to become a priest. And she said, Yes, Father. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not really how it happened. But <laughs> uh, People think that's how it happened. <laughs> uh, my, my road was actually a kind of a winding one. I was involved in my parish very much as a young man. I was an altar server 
and then I also was a sacristan. And I, mainly because of the example of the priest in my parish, I thought I would want to be a priest. And I entered seminary right out of high school. And I was a seminarian for the Diocese of Allentown. In, and I studied at St. Charles Seminary. Then uh, between college years and theology years, I had some questions about whether this is really what I wanted to do with my life and with, if God's really calling me to be a priest and I was considering the marriage, married life. And so I decided not to continue into theology. And God blessed me with a wonderful career that actually started when I was in the seminary and I worked with the deaf. I was a sign language interpreter and I taught interpreting and I was certified and did a lot of court work and all kinds of work as working with the deaf primarily in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. When I got into my 30s, I still felt the call and I felt that might be something I really should pursue. By that time, I really didn't want to be a diocesan priest primarily because they live alone. It's, it's, it's the fewer and fewer priests and we got to pray for vocations. I really felt called to community. So I joined St. Vincent Arch Abbey in uh, Western Pennsylvania, mainly because it was close to my home in Pennsylvania. And I was there for two and a half years. And St. Vincent's was very good to me, but they're a very big monastery and they run a college. And without going into too many details, um, it wasn't the best fit for me in that they were very much about being a college. So I left there. And that, I thought that was it. I thought, well, I'm now over 40, and I tried this twice, and I went back to working with the deaf, but thank God I kept the same spiritual director, a monk. And I would meet him about once a month and talk about things, and he said, why don't you look into St. Bernard in Alabama? I had never even been in the South before, much less to Alabama. I remember my first day driving here going into all these new states that I had never set foot in. <laughs> and I came here, and that was 10 years ago, and it really was the place for me. I am so happy here. I'm so blessed to be a monk and to be a priest. I was ordained in 2017 at the age of 52, and it's been a, it's a wonderful life. I'm very happy here. So that, that that's my my journey. I don't know what what other questions you uh, that that what you want to add. That, what do you want to know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's beautiful, Father. That's a lot. So that desire for the priesthood you said was there since you were even younger. Yeah, yeah. When I when wow. I was in in grade school and high school, uh, I definitely felt an attraction towards the priesthood. Sure. Okay. And did you ever wrestle with that idea? Like, because like you said, you were ordained at, at 52. Yes. That might be the name of this episode, Ordained at 52. Ordained at 52, right, yes. <laughs> that sounds like a, that's a really inspiring story. So, yeah, Father, and you were also considering marriage. So what, what was there some kind of encounter with the Lord or some kind of experience or person who talked to you or did you read something or? Not in any memorable or specific way that made me decide this. One thing that led me to return to religious life, because I had a pretty good life, I owned a home, I owned a car, I, you know, I had a good, pretty good life, um, was actually some of the scandals that were going on in the uh, early 90s with the priesthood. And I felt that it was kind of a, a, almost a call to arms that if you're able to do it, you should do it, because it, the church definitely was hurting and needed priests. And so I think that was probably my motivation at that time to really, you know, say, if you're gonna do this, you gotta do it now. Uh, I had girlfriends, I was, a, you know, attracted to the married life. I came from a very supportive and wonderful family. So that was certainly a, 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 a consideration. And then I also enjoyed the work I was doing. Um, it was very fulfilling. And thank God, I'm actually able, once a month, I go over to Atlanta. In fact, I'm going this weekend, uh, and I offer Mass for the deaf over there. Wow. So I'm able to offer Mass in sign language. So it's, it's really a combination of the two uh, great loves of my life. So that, that's, that's a wonderful blessing. But um, that, yeah. that, that is so cool, Father. You're the only priest I know that 
that speaks sign language no. and communicates okay. with the deaf. So you're really a gift to the church. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you, can you um, say something in sign language <laughs> right now? How would you say? Okay. You guys know what he said? <laughs> no, I said, God loves you very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, usually I do see priests, um, or they have someone translate for them during the homily, but that's really a gift. I think you're one of two people in the world, priests. <laughs> no, there's more than that. There's a lot of priests in the world. We have a, then there's some deaf priests in the world. So, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't think about that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. You guys have any questions for Father? I think the the only question I do have, well, I mean, I have a couple questions, but mm -hmm. the mo the most recent one is, how do you think the church is handling uh, with the issues today of modern society, like, including like you know, people identifying themselves as certain things? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the the first call of the church is always to love people, yes. and that has to be our primary focus. Now, love does not mean that every yeah, to uh, if a parent loves a child, it doesn't mean to approve of everything they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they they people misunderstand unconditional love with irresponsible love. So uh, certainly your uh, six year old might not want to eat vegetables, and you don't say, "Well, I love you so unconditionally, I'm going to let you eat candy all day." We don't do that. We 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 and we believe that there is a truth. I think the church could probably do better in being very clear that we love people and we support them, but we can't be, uh, you know, there, there, there's a plan for all of us that God created us in certain ways, and that's uh, what we should uh, be pursuing. Uh, do you have a specific example, or do you just, just in general? Uh, just in general, because... Um it's just like there's uh, there's so many things that there's you see such a rise in like all this uh, transgender and gen mm -hmm. so changing of genders. Yes. So um, why do, why do you think it's been such a rise lately, especially in our lifetime? Well, I think in, in terms of why it's been a rise lately is that we have largely lost religion in our society. And uh, G.K. Chesterton once said that. When a man loses his religion, it's not that he believes in nothing, it's that he believes in everything. So there are these people who are searching for meaning in their lives, and they're searching for something positive and life-affirming, and that's a very good instinct, but without a religion or a church or a relationship with God and a structure, it's kind of all over the place. So I think that's one of the reasons why we see an increase, let's say, in that kind of awareness. The other thing, specifically about the transgendered issue, is it's a largely a belief system more than it's. It's certainly not a biological no. system. There, you know, we are biologically male or female, and to accept that, you would have to accept that people are spirit beings who happen to in in uh, dwell in bodies. And that you could be in the wrong body because your spirit being is another gender. We don't believe that. No. That's in that. As I said, that's a belief system, and we don't accept that we are separate things. That we are a soul or a spirit that just happens to inf that just happens to be randomly in a body. You are a whole person, and that includes your gender. That includes your, the sexuality that God has given you. Absolutely, Father. I, everything you said, I just think you you nailed it. And G.K. Chesterton, he's also, he's one of my favorite authors yes. as well. And like you were saying, I want to piggyback off what he was saying about G.K. Chesterton. I've also heard as well that there is that loss of the sense of sin and that loss of the sense of identity because, as you said, there's that loss of the sense of God because mm -hmm. there's that loss of the sense of God widely. There's no sense of boundaries, moral boundaries, and there's a lot of tolerance. Like G.K. Chesterton said, you believe in everything, and everything is... The standards are all are all. You know, right. I, I think we have to, place. in compassion, look at people as more lost than sinners. Mm -hmm. Even though a lot of the behavior we would have to objectively say is sinful, many of the people who are doing it are not committing sin. And why do I say that? Because 
to commit sin, you have to know what's wrong yes. and then choose to do the wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's the um, subjective part of sin. You have to know what you're doing is wrong and choose to do wrong. That's the definition of sin. So a lot of people are lost. They're good people and they are honestly seeking truth, but they're seeking it without any guidelines or any boundaries or any structure. So they're all over the place. And I think that's where a lot of people are. And so it, it's more of a question of evangelization than it is of repentance. Sorry, I just pressed the wrong button on this. Sorry, my mm -hmm. going father. I'm not oh, well, master. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not I'm, yeah. I'm, oh. So, what what about the monastery caught your eye? What what was mm. the? Um, well, as as I said, I think the the sense of community was certainly a, a big draw for me. I think the rule of Saint Benedict, which I read, is very tolerant, very moderate. Um, at the time of when St. Benedict wrote, the big thing was to be an extreme monk. Uh, people would do uh, more and more extreme things to show how much they loved God. And Benedict was very much like, no, that's not how you do it. You do it by moderation. You do it consistently. And you live out your life in a uh, structured way. And that really was the, the, re the way that the rule of St. Benedict took off. There were a lot of other rules, but Benedict's is the one that really lasted and had the biggest impact in the church. What was the hardest part about transitioning from being a, I guess, normal person? A normal, to so an long. abnormal person? Is that, <laughs> that was my choice? All right, from being a layman, I think you mean. Uh, from the, the, um, well, there, there, I don't think anything was really hard. It just, it's just a, a change of life. The, you live you start living under obedience so you can't get up and go where you want to go and you know certainly that was that was a big difference for me and not being able to you know if you are interested in something a book or something to purchase it and you have your own money that's gone too uh, so I, but I would say it's more of an adjustment it wasn't really a difficult kind of or hard kind of thing and it was something I was prepared for and I knew that would be it. And then once you live in that life for a period of time, it becomes very natural. It's just part of your life. And um, ever since you entered the monastery, um, how do you feel like your life has changed? I mean, I'm sure it has, but mm -hmm. like in, in the sense of your spiritual life, your Oh, very, mu very much so, very much so. Um, the monastery and the religious life has given me a framework to build my relationship with God. So I was always very close to God. I, I was a you know, practicing Catholic all my life, but to explore the relationship with God in a new way through religious life and particularly through the teachings of St. Benedict uh, only rich, made everything richer. And then being blessed by becoming a priest was another tremendous blessing and uh, really something that um, has, has enriched my life in ways I can't even describe. So, Father, did, what do you think, had you not made the final decision to come to St. Bernard and then join the priesthood, mm -hmm. do you think you would have just continued working with the deaf, or did you have other aspirations? I, um, I probably would have, yeah. I, 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 like I said, that was a very fulfilling career. It was a very good career. So I was um, a tenured professor at my college. So I kind of had everything lined up, you know, and, you know, and good retirement and all those things. So probably, yeah, yeah, I would probably, probably would have stayed in that career. What is your advice for us as mm -hmm. young people when it comes to like staying open to God's call for us? Because you seem like you were very open for mm -hmm. all of your life. <laughs> well. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think you answered it by saying stay open. Um, I think there's concrete steps you can take. One would be to structure your prayer life in terms of uh, a lot of people will say I don't pray enough but they never define what enough is. So I would suggest you, uh, you know, if you're going to say a rosary every day or block out some time for Bible reading or, or attend Mass more regularly, 
but define it, write it down and say, this is what I'm gonna do. And then look at it every month or so and say, maybe I need to make an adjustment. You know, it's, it's your own personal life, but that would be one thing. The other thing I think would do is you have to change a dream into a goal. And the way you do that is by making concrete steps. So you read about it. Um, the internet is wonderful. There's all kinds of religious communities. Uh, so, uh, and, and different ways of serving the Lord. So I think that would be the, the thing. And then the, the other thing to do, and this is true in any career, not just in religious life, find someone who's doing it. Find someone who's actually living the life and say, ask the questions you're asking me and, and, and try to uh, do that. But, but I really think a structured prayer life would be very, very helpful. And how was that? You said you were practicing a Catholic mostly your whole life, or all, all, your, life, life, all yes. your life. How did you structure your prayer life? Well, uh, it certainly got a lot better when I became a monk. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> because I, I, I would go, I went to daily mass, um, though not all the time. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, there are seasons in our lives, and so I, when when things were going very well, I, I would uh, do mass. I would uh, try and do holy hours a couple times a week, things like that. So. Um, but like I said, the, the more that you can add a regularity to prayer, the more fruitful your prayer will be. The one thing that a lot of people will say is, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Ugh. And I'm, I'm always suspect of that. Mm. Now, some people do it. I'm not saying that, but what I ask them to do, what it, the, the litmus test, so to speak, is what do you do that you don't feel like doing? Because people who spirits say, well, I walk in the woods, or I, you know, meditate, or I say, okay, that's, that's fine. Do you do it every day? Do you have a schedule? Do you, because anybody in religious life, or anybody who, I know many of you are athletes, and, you know, you have to do things you don't feel like doing. So if it's only based on emotion, or your feelings that day, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, you know, uh, one thing about religious life, I think Sister will back me up on this, we're not on retreat all the time. It's work. <laughs> you know? And there are days when all you can offer to the Lord at morning prayer is your presence. You know, you, you're not, you know, on a cloud nine inspiration. And, it, you know, the, the, the scriptures are always beautiful, but, you know, some days you're tired. And so, again, having that regularity of prayer and regularity of life can re as you know, if you're a soccer player or whatever uh, sport you're in, you have to go to practice on days you don't feel like going to practice. That's part of growth. All right. <laughs> Oh, yes, Father. So when you're speaking of structure, I had a question, too. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain the difference between a monasticism and, let's say, um, another religious male apostolic order, um, let's say, the difference between your community and the Jesuits and the Franciscans, because even us, even the, the Limb Sisters, we also have a difference between us and the nuns over at the shrine, for example. Mm -hmm. And many times I get envious of them because they get to spend a lot of time with the Lord <laughs> right, alone yes. with Him. And I'll, you see me, and I'm running around all over Coleman mm -hmm. right, driving right. with other sisters, but they both have a balanced way of life, and, and, and it's fulfilling. Mm -hmm. God really fulfills um, that desire of spiritual motherhood and spiritual fatherhood, mm -hmm. a desire that He designed for your heart. So I was wondering if you could speak about yeah those differences that sure. a lot of people don't know. Sure. Well, the biggest divide is the monastic life and the mendicant life. And you have two examples here. So um, the man, and the biggest difference to that is the monastic life is founded or centered on a monastery, and we kind of plant our flag. One of the vows that Benedictine monks take is a vow of stability, which means that I'm not only a Benedictine monk, I'm a Benedictine monk of St. Bernard Abbey. That's my home, my time here will end with a slow walk to the cemetery, uh, and I know where I'll be buried, and th 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 this is my life. And then we draw people to us. Uh, you wonderful students, people who come to retreat here, uh, so, so that's the, the monastic model, is setting a place and then having people draw. Mendicants, which uh, really started with St. Dominic and St. Francis and then other saints along the way, uh, and other founders of religion, go out into the world. Their job is to bring Christ to people where they are. So that's, a diff that's the major Difference. Now, the sisters at the shrine are contemplatives, 
And what a contemplative is, 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 is in the monastic tradition, and they live a life of prayer in a cloister. Now, we have part of our house that's called the cloister, which we don't have guests in. We live, that, that's for, just for the monks. But their whole building is a cloister. And they dedicate their life to uh, prayer. But they also have a service, and even a service to each other. One, now, an extreme uh, religious life are some people who are called to be hermits. And that's an unusual call. And the one question that's often raised about hermits is whose feet do they wash? In other words, who do they actually serve? So, and service is a huge part of Christian life. So, um, not that I want to disparage any hermit, but it, 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 is, it is a question. You know, how, how, do, how do you live out that, that aspect of your Christian life? So, um, and, and that's one thing, you know, and again, the internet is such a blessing. You know, do research. Find out what they do. Uh, the, do you feel called to be a teacher or um, a missionary, even a missionary in, in, in your own country? Doesn't mean you have to go to someplace else. Or are you more drawn to the um, more can either more monastic or more cloistered life. The, all those things are are factors, and you can find a good religious community. You know that still will challenge you. Uh, the one thing I would not recommend is joining a community with ideas that you have that they don't do. That happens sometimes to um, men who come to the monastery, and they have all kinds of ideas of the ministry they want to do. Mm -hmm. which are beautiful ministries, but they're not ours. You know, if you come to St. Bernard, okay, you're going to teach very bright, very good-looking high school students for the rest of your life. <laughs> that's, you know, that's what we do here. Um, and we have, you know, weekend ministry, and we, you know, that's been all our monks are into school, but we, you know, we have our grotto, we have our farm. This is what we do. And so it's more, can I serve in that community as it is? If you come with your own set of things you want to do and you want to change, you know, it, 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 that doesn't usually work out. Yes. Yes. Well, Father, uh, before before we end here, and by the way, everything you said was just wonderful. I feel like oh, I'm sitting <laughs> with the next Summa Theologiae. Oh my <laughs> If you ever, I don't know if you've heard this term, but I used, to, I used to have a professor in Christendom, and he, well, okay, he's famous. I'm going to give him a shout out to Father Milady, and he's mm -hmm. just like full of knowledge. And I feel, we were, we were talking, I was talking with my other classmates, um, other sisters and brothers, and they were saying that <laughs> being next to him is like putting a Dixie cup under Niagara Falls. Oh my goodness. <laughs> just like pouring all this information on you, and you're, <laughs> wait, wait, one at a time. You're not like that. It's no. just perfect, Father. Yeah. Oh, thank not you. Niagara <laughs> Falls, but just, just, yeah, perfect enough, and just so concise, so easy to understand and lucid so i want to thank you again for coming father this is a much we have to, we have to do this again we have to have back, okay. back episode or something like that <laughs> and then also um i know a lot of young men out there and they are they are holy holy prayerful young men and they're open mm -hmm. to the priesthood some of them are discerning and some of them are dating holy young women and so i was wondering what advice you could give to to them the ones who who are open but they just they keep wrestling they go, oh but i, I want to be a lawyer and i've heard that a lot i want to be a lawyer but you know or i want to be a dad and i have that desire to be a dad but they're mm -hmm. also it's like they have different desires Can sure you, yeah what, well first of all those are the kind of men and women we want in religious life we don't it, religious life is not a place to hide from the world so and i do a lot of work with vocations and my two questions that i always have in the back of my mind and sometimes i will articulate them when I look at a young man who's coming is first of all can I see this man as a father if he's maybe a more mature man or if he's a young man can I at least see him with a girlfriend and also is he doing something with his life and it can it can be you know for a young person it can be just ambition but are you pursuing something and what, what if we said no or it turned out not to be for you what would you do with your life and if they don't have an answer, or they're very vague, or this is all I want to do, that then you have to look at what they're putting on God's altar. Um, in terms of, you know, so we want people with a full life. I think it's wonderful that young people date. 
and get to know the, you know, and, and, and dating is remote preparation for marriage. It can be very remote, but certainly people who are married or committed don't date because it, it is remote preparation for marriage. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I would say about dating um, is try to date Catholics. <laughs> Be leery of dating non-Catholic Christians mm -hmm. because it's going to be an issue. But sorry, do not date non-Christians. Mm. I mean, I'm just you know I, I hate to be so blunt, but you know people do that. They fall in love. They are, commit to each other, and then they have a conversation. Sometimes after the baby arrives, mommy, who's Jesus? Well, for Daddy, Jesus is the Savior of the world, and for Mommy, it's completely, yeah. it's complete loss. So, the, the best thing to do is not to start down that road, because you can get, you, you know, you, you, you can think, well, we're just hanging out, we're just dating, it's casual, and you end up very much in love with a person who is not going to be able to share your faith, and that has to be the center of your life. So, that would be my my advice but don't be you know if you feel called to the priesthood or to the sisterhood or to to religious life it doesn't mean you can't date in fact i think it's better that you do um that you explore that and you explore light and and be open to what god's calling you to do beautiful thank you father and we are all about the faith in here so oh, good thank you for saying that mm -hmm. um it's twelve thirty six, and i know you have prior's office today yeah or, okay i was wondering if you could have time to play a quick game with us oh sure Do i love games okay. all right all right <laughs> okay this is called the bible name game they haven't played this either so i'm going to explain it okay. okay so you have to do the beat it's um well because we're on the mics you go clap clap snap snap and you keep doing that now everyone has to say the name of a character in the bible or a yeah biblical figure character somebody somebody in the bible person in the bible so it could be like adam noah moses abraham they're all going to steal my names now yeah. um you know <laughs> judas or anyone you know Pontius pilot okay? okay and you all you can't recycle and you have to be on the beat so it would be like this let me give an example it'd be like this jesus and the next question would be Mary, so you, so you have to do it on beat. Now, if you if you mess up or someone says something, then make sure we know. You're who's, out. Yeah, you're yeah. Out. Okay, let's do it. Let's do I, it. I, I, I'm fine with the Bible names. I can't do the beat though. That's gonna be my problem. <laughs> it's okay. Follow me. <laughs> All right, here okay. we go. All right. All right. So let's. We have to go in a, like a circle. So maybe Jose, me, Father Maddie, and then go around Emma, and then Artura, and then back there. Okay, right. we got the order. Right. Well, let me. Can I get the beat down? <laughs> okay, so it's snap, snap, clap, 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 clap. clap so. Okay, after so after the second one, it says it's the name. <laughs> yeah, when you go to the snapping part, yeah. then you say the name. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. So, okay. can you tell me what name you have so that I can help you with the first one? Was it? Uh, I was just saying Jesus. Okay, Jesus. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Let's do that. Okay. Jesus. Jesus. Mary. Well, she's an act. Mary Magdalene. Esther. Paul. <laughs> Mark. Jonah. Simon. Eve. Peter. Job. John. <laughs> Simon. Did you want to say Simon? Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> Good try, Claudia. All right. Let's do. Let's do one. Let's do another round. Yeah. Okay. okay. All With, right. But now you have to. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna. Yes. Yeah, okay. You ready, Molly? Okay. Hope you remember. No recycling. Mm -hmm. Wait. Can I say the one I just said? Yeah. You can okay, start. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and you start. Okay. Go ahead. Adam. <laughs> Oh, I said Adam. You did? I did. Oh my gosh. It's okay. Oh no. I can't think of it. Can I try again? Okay. Let's do. Let's do another one. Let's do another round. Okay. With all of you, all of you in it. Okay. I don't even know okay. what names we said. But um, yeah. Okay. Go ahead and think of your names. I heard a lot of Old Testament. You can do the New Testament too. There's okay, twelve apostles, one. twelve yeah. tribes of. I got it. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Go. Ready. Judas. Daniel. Linus. Bartholomew. <laughs> Zacchaeus. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> <Matthew>. <laughs> Moses. Peter. I 
said Peter. Ahab. Oh! <laughs> nice try. Playing. Okay. Well, it's 12.39. You All right. I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. Good. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. Um, I'm out of names. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. Of things go. Okay. Oh, Ready? Think about all the books of the Bible game. Timothy. Bartimaeus. <laughs> Philip. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know you gotta think quick, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Last. Let's do the last round, then I'm gonna change up the category. All right. Okay. Ready? Are you ready? Okay. Andrew. John the Baptist. Joseph. Stephen. Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Matthew. I'm going, I'm okay, done. good one. Okay, now, okay, I'm gonna change it up. I'm gonna do another category. It's, this is, these are places, like geographic places. You can say Alabama, Alaska, Coleman, Hawaii, Asia, Ukraine. So like, anything. Yeah, city, any capital. location. And we're gonna keep going until we stop. Okay, make sure you have- Now, now yeah. uh, when I played this game, we had to do it by <laughs> alphabetical order. So you no. do, oh, keep going A's, A's, A's until point. you run out, and then B's, and then... <laughs> that's, that's, sorry, Father, I can't, I can't think that. All right, all right, that's okay. fun. Oh. We'll do that. I'll do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to try that. We're going to try right. that later. All right. <laughs> but um, but yeah, let's do yeah, just geographic. I'm having a hard time just coming up with it right on the spot. Okay, so, so. it can be a city, a capital, or anything, right? Yeah, continent, okay. region. Okay. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Alabama. Alaska. Coleman. Arizona. <laughs> Alabaster. Montpelier. <laughs> Germany. Birmingham. Texas. Salt Lake City. France. Oh, <laughs> All right, good job, Father. All right, well, thank you for playing with us. We really right. enjoyed your visit. Um, or would you like to end with a closing prayer? Before sure, we end? sure. <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for this time together. May it inspire those whom God is calling to whatever walk of life, that they may always serve you with joy and gratitude. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Father. Father. And thank you for our listeners.